West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théâtres, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Donald Trump is in a full meltdown mode on his social media platform, making posts that would constitute obvious admissions of the crimes he is being charged with in Manhattan in the criminal case that's about to start having the jury deliberations taking place. No doubt those jury deliberations are haunting Donald Trump's ability to even sleep right now. Donald Trump is also making statements that in my view would be a clear violation of the gag order regarding the jury. And Trump is whining and saying it's unfair that the jury is not being sequestered and that the jury has uh, seven days uh, prior to when summations going to be taking place, with Don- which Donald Trump says is unfair. That would be a clear violation of the gag order, which I think is going to be addressed on Tuesday. Let's just take a look at some of the posts that he's been making. Oh, and by the way, he's also making posts saying that the speech that he gave in front of the Libertarian Convention in D.C. was successful and the crowd that mercilessly booed him was actually full of enthusiasm. It doesn't get much more embarrassing than this, folks. He is just so utterly pathetic. Here's what he posts. He goes, in addition to the fact that I did nothing wrong, NDAs are totally legal and commonly used and that virtually every legal scholar and expert says in written form that this is a case which has no merit and should not have been brought. My lawyers have informed me that the highly conflicted and corrupt Judge Juan Mershon will not allow reliance on counsel, which virtually everyone is allowed to use as an additional, though not needed, because I did nothing wrong defense. This quote case, which could have been brought seven years ago, but wasn't because it has no merit, is a disgrace. It was only begun to interfere with crooked Joe Biden's political opponent, me. Then he puts this all in caps, reliance on counsel, make America great again, exclamation point. As the Mueller She Wrote account writes, Trump is admitting he participated in the catch and kill. NDAs are obviously not illegal, but reimbursing your lawyers and calling it legal fees is. He also appears to admit he relied on Cohen's advice. Advice to do what? Pay him back for the hush money and then falsifying business records? Now, for an advice of counsel defense, if you want to put on that defense, guess what, Donald? You would have to testify. Your lawyers, like all lawyers who are representing criminal defendants, would have to disclose an advice of counsel defense 
prior to the time that trial starts, but even as trial was taking place, your lawyers, I'm sure, could have informed Justice Mershon, look, we will be relying on an advice of counsel defense. Now, if you rely on an advice of counsel defense, you waive attorney-client privilege, and the criminal defendant has to testify about their reliance on the advice of counsel. So you, coward, you, Mr. Pathetic, you would have to take the stand and you can talk about what you think you relied on, whether it was from Michael Cohen or otherwise, that led you to commit a crime to try to vitiate the intent element from the criminal conduct at issue, the same way all criminal defendants do um, if they want to assert that defense. Now, you are, of course, too cowardly to testify. Now, what your lawyers try to do is say, oh, well, because Donald Trump doesn't want to testify, we're not claiming an advice of counsel defense. We're claiming something different. We'll call it a presence of counsel defense, which we'll just make up. And Justice Mershon said, a presence of counsel defense isn't something that exists. That's not a lawful defense. You can make the advice of counsel defense, but Trump would have to testify. And of course, Trump was too cowardly to testify. But it's all right. Mislead your MAGA sheep. Lie to them. Make them think like you're a tough guy. Go to the NASCAR race and wave to the crowd and pretend that the crowd's there to see you and not the NASCAR race like you did on Sunday, you pathetic loser, you. That's what he actually did. After getting booed at the Libertarian Convention, he went to a NASCAR race in Charlotte where there was a big crowd and he started waving to them while they were watching the race. Don't play, this is what he did over the weekend. Play this clip. But I digress. Then Donald Trump posts the following, and this would be a violation of the gag order in my opinion. Trump goes, can anyone believe that the Soros-backed DA, Alvin Bragg, was able to get a delay of seven days to his corrupt and unconstitutional case against me with no sequester? Legal expense equals legal expense, exclamation that means. The only thing Bragg has going for him is the corrupt and highly conflicted judge, which is a lot. You see how terrified Donald Trump is here. And again, saying that a sequester with no sequester, that's referring to a jury sequester. This jury's not sequestered. The idea of juries being sequestered or like put in a hotel where they can't go back to their families. That's really not something that takes place anymore in the modern day. It's very rare to, to see that. But Trump's making a statement right here. This is clearly a statement intended to threaten, harass, intimidate, or manipulate the jury. Now, Justice Mershon would have actually liked uh, the jury to start deliberating this week. But guess what it was? It was Memorial Day weekend, right? Well, you would know that, right? Because your kids, your degenerate children, um, are posting that this is a family, the Trump family, that gave up everything to save America. Thank you. And Eric Trump goes, and we will do it again. So on Memorial Day, where we should be honoring the ultimate sacrifices made by our troops, by our men and women and people in the armed services, this is how you, you think the ultimate sacrifice is what your family did, grifting, violating the emolument clause, taking the great symbolism of our country so y'all can make money off it, so Ivanka and Jared makes $600 million in the White House, and then Jared gets $2 billion from the Saudis after MBS, the leader of Saudi Arabia, says that he has Jared in his pocket. How despicable and disgusting of a family you all are. Here's what Adam Kinzinger put. He goes, I wasn't going to tweet anything political this weekend, but I have to make an exception for this, what Eric Trump posted on Memorial Day. Your family has sacrificed nothing. Your name will become synonymous with Benedict Arnold. And how dare you tweet this this weekend? You do not know the first thing about service. 
apologize. I digress there for a second because what Donald Trump is saying, I can't believe the judge didn't order a sequester. It's a Memorial Day weekend. You would not allow proceedings to take place the prior Friday because you said you were going to the graduation of Barron. So the uh, case did not continue on that Friday. So because of Memorial Day and because of when closing arguments are going to be taking place, that is why uh, there's a brief delay because there is no court on Monday and because court is dark for the holidays and then there was the weekend break and then after uh, court concluded on Tuesday, there is no court on Wednesday. So it just doesn't make sense to start summation on a Thursday heading into Memorial Day weekend. And by the way, had you just stipulated to get in records that should easily have come in, this case could have been completed about two weeks ago. But you're the reason for this delay because like with all things, you're a pathetic, whiny loser with a victim complex that disgraces our nation each and every day. You pathetic loser, you. And then Donald Trump uh, posts the following, speaking about what a pathetic loser he is. He goes, the, he says this, the reason, so he posts, the reason I didn't file paperwork for the libertarian nomination, which I could have absolutely gotten if I wanted it, as everyone could tell by the enthusiasm of the crowd last night, was the fact that as the Republican nominee, I'm not allowed to have the nomination of another party. Regardless, I believe I will get a majority of the libertarian votes. Junior Kennedy is a radical left Democrat who's destroyed everything he's touched, especially in New York and New England, and in particular as it relates to the cost of practicality of energy. He's not a libertarian, only a fool would vote for him. Well, there was actually a vote at the Libertarian Convention on who they were going to nominate. Stormy Daniels got a vote. Ben Dover got a vote. You got six votes, less than 1% of the Libertarian delegates after booing the crap out of your pathetic self while you were on stage to your face. You got less than 1% of the support for those people who you were begging for their support and saying, I'll do whatever you want to do. I'll put a Libertarian in there. You just tell me what you want as they booed you to your pathetic little face. You couldn't even get 1%. By the way, as you confiscated their squeaky toy chickens, yeah, at a libertarian convention, you, you pathetic loser, ordered the Secret Service, who should not even be doing this with our tax dollars, to confiscate the squeaky toy chickens that were being passed out where the libertarians wanted to squeak and squeeze them while you were giving your speech, you were such a snowflake that you had those confiscated by the Secret Service at a libertarian convention, while not even in an office ordering the Secret Service to take away squeaky chickens. Guess what? They can still boo you, which they did the entire time while you were giving the speech. And I know you want to say there was enthusiasm. There was not. You got to see for a moment what the world and what this country really thinks about you when you're not surrounded by your weirdo MAGA cult members. So there you have it, folks. That's Donald Trump. By the way, you want to know what President Biden was doing over this weekend instead? President Biden was at the West Point graduation, shaking the hands of all 1,036 graduates. One by one, he spent 70 minutes shaking everyone's hand, saluting and shaking the hands of each graduate. He gave an incredible speech. He said that America is the strongest when we lead, not only by the example of our power, but by the power of our example. To the West Point class of 2024, congratulations. You make the entire nation proud. Here's what President Biden said in his speech. Play the clip. Freedom is not free. It requires constant vigilance. And for, from the very beginning, nothing is guaranteed about our democracy in America. Every generation has an obligation to defend it, to protect it, to preserve it, to choose it. Now is your turn. 
asked, what was President Biden doing? President Biden was visiting Uvalde. President Biden said it's been two years since 21 innocent souls were taken at Robb Elementary in Uvalde, Texas. No community should have to ever go through what their community suffered. We have to do more. It's time for those who obstruct, delay, or block common sense gun reform to act. Here's what President Biden was doing, shaking the hands of American workers. My investing in America agenda is fueling a historic boom, rebuilding our roads and bridges, developing and deploying clean energy, revitalizing American manufacturing, and more. So while Donald Trump was spending his time confiscating toy chickens, while Donald Trump was spending his time whining and attacking the jury for not being sequestered, while Donald Trump was pretending that the speech he gave was a great one while he got booed the entire time. By the way, Trump reposting pathetic MAGA Republican Senator Mike Lee saying Trump knocked it out of the park tonight at the hashtag libertarian convention. You knocked what out of the park? You got booed the entire time. I mean, again, such a pathetic movement, this MAGA, such a pathetic loser he is. Uh, We'll see what happens this week when the jury deliberates, but justice, I hope, will be served. It is Monday, the 27th of May of 2024, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam, Gunner the English Bulldog, is our snoozing sous chef. Precious, the little Yorkie, is our door girl, and she will be seating you directly for our especially special daily special River City Hash Mondays, and it's also Memorial Day Monday, even though Memorial Day is later on in the week. Today's the day that we're going to celebrate it and have the barbecue, and maybe memorialize those who died in service to democracy, freedom, and the American way, which is not being a Nazi, okay? The American way is not being a Nazi. The American way is punching Nazis. And people who ban Nazi punchers, well, I would say they're Nazis. Or at least sympathizers. They are. Okay, so we have uh, quite a long weekend, and we decided to do a show today on Friday. So we're keeping our promise because that's what we do. That stated, <clears throat> we may uh, we may have a few longer clips, maybe. We'll see. Uh, but uh, uh, we will probably not go on the long, long rants that we usually do nowadays. And instead, maybe we'll dig deep into these uh, stories as they as as we have curated them. But uh, I thought I'd mention a few things that came across the transom. It looks like Richard Dreyfus was at a uh, um, what a Richard Dreyfus uh, thing in on the Eastern Seaboard, maybe Connecticut. I can't quite remember where, but at a movie theater. And uh, they were giving him an award for being, you know, Richard Dreyfus, the great actor. And apparently, <clears throat> before he got up on stage, uh, Richard Dreyfus kind of hit the red wine quite a bit. I saw pictures of people who were, you know, standing in front of the banner of this uh, this event and uh, doing, you know, the, the fo- photo ops with uh, Richard, who's sitting while other people are standing, and he's drinking red wine. And uh, then he came up on the stage, and he went off like he's James Woods. Okay. Belittle the Me Too movement, belittle Black Lives Matter, uh, just any number of things that are really kind of off the wall, very, very right wing. And people booed him. This was an event to honor Richard Dreyfus, and he offended his uh, well followers so terribly. Well, you know the demographic is you know skewed apparently from what I read uh, towards the PBS listening crowd, a little bit older, a little bit more moneyed, and very very liberal. 
So I like how in my neck of the woods, if you're very, very liberal, you're a commie because we believe in voting. (laughs) I'm serious. The MAGA Nazis around here just hate voting because anybody can do it. We're bringing in people from overseas. So in six years, they can take over. (laughs) How many times have I heard that before? From bigoted racists. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're so unreflective upon their own prejudices and behaviors that they absolutely deny they're being racist. We are the ones being racist because we don't accept that they as white men and their little white wives are the ones who are really being discriminated against. It's racism against whites. Yeah, I was put on restriction for saying that's a bunch of bullshit. (laughs) I didn't say it was a bunch of bullshit. But they know it's a bunch of bullshit. And I said, no, you're not. (sighs) Reverse racism, all that BS again, rearing its right head. Mm -hmm. Actually, the correct way of saying it would be rightist. So, um, uh, Richard Dreyfus uh, looks like, as I said on social media, looks like he's going to need a bigger PR department. Boy, Robert Shaw was right about Richard Dreyfus. Robert Shaw did not get along with Richard Dreyfus. He thought Richard Dreyfus was a not a real actor. Now, you have to understand, when a Brit becomes an actor, it doesn't matter if they're part of the angry young men, which Richard, Richard Dreyfus was part of. They came up through a very rigorous academic uh, theater uh, background. Uh, You don't just, like, get discovered and are put on the stage or screen. So Richard or uh, Robert Shaw is a penultimate, or was a penultimate actor. And Richard Dreyfuss is, you know, Strasbourg uh, method acting. You know, he came out of that kind of school, which I will confess, so did I. But um, this is not to say that the Brits were, you know, absent of any method acting techniques. They knew exactly what that was, but they were trained actors, thespians, meaning that they had to do some stuff behind the scenes in production. Okay. Okay. So not just acting, you had to also work as a crew member. That's how you become a thespian. So, Robert Shaw did not respect Richard Dreyfus, called him a little twerp. And uh, they did not get along. And uh, now I know why. Boy, I got to tell you, John Voight, Richard Dreyfus, all the actors I really liked. <sighs> I don't know. I was wondering if my um, my trust in actors. Oh, you know what? I remember now. I was going to mention that maybe my trust in actors uh, waned from uh, a, a more recent time. But now I remember <clears throat> I used to like Mel Gibson a lot. I still consider... The Year of Living Dangerously to be one of the better movies, if not one of the greatest movies of all time. I just love that movie. But because of Mel Gibson, it's you know, I I I I I, it's just hard to watch a Mel Gibson movie now knowing what he is. And it was the time when he was pulled over by the cops, I think in Trabuca Canyon, maybe drunk on his ass and started going off on the cop being a Jew and just crazy ass shit. Now, I was aware that his dad is some sort of wacko Catholic uh, cultist in the middle of nowhere, the outback. So I don't know, that poison can distill in the heat, apparently. And uh, that's what uh, Mel Gibson grew up in. The first movie I was ever aware of was a movie called Tim, where Mel Gibson played a developmentally handicapped individual who uh, and 
gosh, the actress, all of a sudden I'm having a brain lag. I don't think it was Helen Mirren, but regardless, it was an, sort of like an older woman took him under the wing and they fall in love. And it was just a sweet, sweet movie. And I was convinced, as m- most of my friends were, that Mel Gibson was like, they picked him up off the street and uh, put him in front of the screen. And he was, you know, he played the developmentally uh, handicapped individual quite well to the point that we thought that maybe he was. And uh, certainly now we know he's, well, intellectually and emotionally stunted. Morally, my God. So it's hard to watch that. I was going to mention that I thought maybe it was uh, Woody Allen, his fall from grace in my mind. Actually, you know what? It may have been Woody Allen before the Mel Gibson thing. Indeed, it was. Because we used to line up for Woody Allen movies, make jokes about Marshall McLuhan in line. And uh, it was like, For us, going to see a Woody Allen movie was sort of pre-Rocky Horror Picture Show kind of thing. You know, we had a group. We would recite the lines during the movie. And, uh, yeah, when he uh, was accused of those heinous uh, accusations of pedophilia and, you know, with his own adopted kids, and then he marries, you know, one of the adopted kids, and... She says everything's fine, but I don't know. It's just creepy to me. So it's hard for me to watch a Woody Allen movie anymore because of that. And then there's James Woods, and there's any other number, Gary Sinise, and they're just endless. I wish they would just shut up. It was better thinking these guys were just really, or people, were really good actors, and, uh, you know, Since they're really good actors, then that means that they must have some uh, understanding of the universe, and so therefore they would be liberal. Well, apparently not. That childish understanding, uh, yeah. Boy, have I learned differently from that. Jeez. Anyway, I mentioned that I wasn't going to go off on one of these long rants, but I did. So what do we have in store for you in the curated part that I alluded to so many minutes ago? Well, what do we have curated for you in the Bistro Cafe as we begin on this fabulous Memorial Day River City Hash Mondays? Oregon officials have warned against drinking raw milk as a bird flu outbreak spreads among dairy farms. And uh, I will tell you, you know, raw milk products when I was in France, it's much better. The cheese tastes better. It's just better. But here in America... We have so many different ecological regions and whatnot. We need a standardized um, distribution system. And pasteurized milk is the only way. Otherwise, people, you know, if you're not used to a particular terroir in your milk, you could get sick just from that. So be careful with raw milk. My experience in France is that it really is better. But here in America, too dangerous. Continuing here, a Virginia tech company was hit with a DOJ fine after it sent up a job posting seeking only white candidates. Mm -hmm. And a Riverside, California woman who bombarded the former executive director of Pittsburgh's Tree of Life Synagogue with phone calls and threatening voicemails, has been sentenced to almost three years in prison. Good riddance. Should have been more. After the break, we move to the chef's table where British police say four people were hurt and one was arrested when supporters of Iran's authorities clashed with anti-government protesters at a London event marking the death of President Ebrahim Raisi. Yeah, the pro-government thugs came and beat the crap out of the anti-Raisi group. Hmm. And a Paris court sentenced three high-ranking Syrian officials in absentia to life in prison for complicity in war crimes. Okay, well, do Assad. 
All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. It's being the holiday, and we got such a late start at the beginning. We're going to tuck into this first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, River City Hash Mondays. And it is out of Oregon Public Broadcasting by Alejandro Figueroa. The Oregon Health Advisory is warning against drinking raw or unpasteurized milk as a precaution. That warning comes amid several reported cases of H5N1 bird flu in dairy cattle herds among nine states, including Idaho. There are no reported cases of bird flu in Oregon dairy cows. The U.S. Department of Agriculture has confirmed over 50, that's five zero, dairy herds across several states have tested positive for bird flu, and the virus could be more widespread than current testing suggests, which is a nice way of saying current testing sucks, they're not doing it enough. A recent U.S. Food and Drug Administration report found when nearly 300 retail milk samples were tested, about 20% of the samples were positive for trace amounts of the virus, though none contained the live infectious virus. Dr. Emilio DeBess, Oregon's public health veterinarian, said there was no live virus because the milk sold in grocery stores is pasteurized. He said when the milk is heated, that kills disease-causing bacteria and viruses. Although bird infections tend to be rare and mild, there have been reported cases of human infections with the virus. The virus tends to be fatal in poultry or wild birds. Let me just say that the bird flu jumping from dairy cattle to a human is exceedingly rare, and now that it's happening... Uh Uh-huh. You know. Beyond bird flu, some of the health risks of raw milk could include E. coli or salmonella sickness. Young and elderly people are are more susceptible, according to the best. I don't think it's according to the state veterinarian. It is according to science and the CDC, et cetera, et cetera, please. In Oregon, people can only buy raw cow's milk directly from a farm. It is not sold at traditional grocery stores or provided to children in schools. Oregon health officials said there have been at least 11 recorded outbreaks of illness caused by consuming raw milk from cows and goats since 1993. Amanda Yen, the breaking news intern at the Daily Beast, brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. A Virginia tech company was hit with a DOJ fine after it sent up a job posting seeking only white candidates. The department announced in a news release 
Arthur Grand Technologies began advertising in March of 2023 that they were looking for U.S.-born citizens, white, who are local within 60 miles from Dallas, Texas, don't share with candidates, with the brackets left in place. So they had brackets around white and uh, don't share with candidates and that was bracketed as well, meaning, get these out of here! <laughs> The department began investigating in May of 2023 and determined that Arthur Grand discriminated based on citizenship status and national origin after a recruiter working for Arthur Grand's subsidiary in India posted the advertisement on the job website Indeed. Assistant Attorney General Kristen Clark said it was shameful that executives were still using segregationist policies in the 2020s and said she shares the public's outrage at the appalling and discriminatory action. The DOJ did not disclose the exact amount Arthur Grand was fined, but reports do say that it was a piddly 400 grand. of the Los Angeles Times brings us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. River City Hash Mondays on a Memorial Day weekend holiday Monday. A Riverside woman who bombarded the former executive director of Pittsburgh's Tree of Life Synagogue with phone calls and threatening voicemails. The first coming just months after the deadliest anti-Semitic attack on U.S. soil has been sentenced to almost three years in prison. Melanie Harris, age 59, hurled anti-Semitic slurs, vowed violence, including beheadings, and used vile and inflammatory language, according to a Miami-based FBI agent. Harris, who pled guilty in March, was sentenced by a Miami judge to 32 months in prison, followed by three years of supervised release for intentionally transmitting a threatening communication in interstate commerce, the Federal Bureau of Prisons will determine where Harris will serve her sentence. Uh, Markenzie LaPointe, U.S. attorney for the Southern District of Florida, said Harris's anti-Semitic threats terrorized a Jewish family. Her hate-filled telephone calls and voicemails were abhorrent, no one should live in fear of threats, harassment, and hate-fueled violence, LaPointe said in a statement. The calls began in February of 2019, according to court documents, just months after Robert Bauer shot and killed 11 worshippers at the Pittsburgh Synagogue on October 27th of 2018. Bowers, who has since been convicted and sentenced to death, espoused white supremacist views and ranted about his, his hatred of Jews online prior to the shooting. Harris cloaked her identity using the uh, star 67 feature, which blocks caller identification and left voicemails laden with anti-Semitic and harassing language, according to court documents. She initially placed three calls in a span of three minutes, first to Tree of Life, and then twice calling a person identified in court documents as victim number one, the former executive director of Tree of Life 
who was then living in the Pittsburgh area. Between February of 2019 and March of 2022, Harris called the director an additional 53 times. An analysis presented in court demonstrated that Harris attempted 190 calls between October of 22 and February of 23, including 129 in November alone. Many of those calls, however, were unanswered or immediately hung up on. All calls to victim number one were made from Harris's Riverside home. Harris left 15 voicemails on November 1st on October 3rd of 22, including four threatening and anti-Semitic messages. In one, court documents say, Harris twice threatened to decapitate the director's stepchild, whom she referred to using an anti-Semitic slur. The same day, Harris made three additional calls to the director, all advocating similar violence against his family and against him. Good riddance, lady. All right, that brings us to our break. And when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world and we will finish up with the stories that we have curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. NetRootsRadio.com Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Take Two Movie Review. I'm Kim Lowe. This week, the script supervisor was imaginary. As one of the few who have successfully transitioned from sitcom star to hit director, John Krasinski is better off sticking with horror. His latest offering, If, is written and directed by him and is well-intentioned but can't compensate for a weak script. If, which stands for Imaginary Friend, tells the story of Bee, a young girl who is staying with her grandmother for the summer in New York City. Bee has already lost her mother to unknown circumstances and her father, played by Krasinski, is in the hospital awaiting an operation for an undisclosed condition condition that we get the impression is more serious than he's letting on. Needless to say, the idea of potentially losing her only surviving parent is stressful for B. It's all she can think of until she meets the mysterious Calvin, Ryan Reynolds, who lives in her grandmother's apartment building. Calvin's unlikely job is trying to pair imaginary friends with new kids after their original companions have outgrown them. When asked to be his helper, B agrees and hijinks and important life lessons ensue. While cleverly presented, it becomes predictable and a tad cloying. Adult viewers looking for any subtlety won't find it. But for young kids, the cloying may read as cute. Even the so-called plot twist is something that can be seen a mile away and mostly exacerbates the just-mentioned issues. Despite all that, there is some amazing talent on display, including Phoebe Waller-Bridge, who supplies the voice of the long-retired imaginary friend Blossom, and child actor Kaylee Fleming as the lead B. While Krasinski has finally succeeded in making a movie his kids can watch, it's unlikely that you or any kid over 10 will appreciate if... This has been Take-Two Movie Review. I'm Kim Lowe. Catch up with us at Take-TwoMovieReview.com and feed us back on our channel on YouTube. I was in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean when it happened. There was a sudden jolt and our submarine crashed on the seafloor. We were in total darkness. That's Dr. Dejana Figueroa, a marine biologist and STEM teacher, talking about a deep sea dive she'll never forget. It's funny, when I was a kid, I was afraid of the ocean. And there I was, two miles below the surface. But as a scientist, you prepare for that. Using our training and a little creativity, we fixed the sub and finished our experiments. The dive was just too important. Every dive gives us glimpses at things few people ever get to see. Blowing creatures, fiery undersea volcanoes, When we got back to the surface, I kissed the ground and called my mom, of course. But you know what? I wouldn't trade that dive for anything. Dr. Figueroa uses her passion for STEM to discover new things and make the world a better place. She can STEM, so can you. Check out She Can STEM for more stories and inspiration. 
A message from the Ad Council. If you came across someone struggling with hunger, how would you recognize them? By their clothes, their age, the way they speak? Would you notice an eight-year-old girl who's, who's not, not excited, excited for, for summer, summer break because she may not be having lunch again until September? Or a single father of two who works three, three part-time jobs and still can't put enough food on the table. Or maybe a mother who cleans offices at night, hoping to find meeting leftovers to take home to her hungry family. Or a war veteran who's, who's having, having a hard, hard time, time landing, landing a job and getting back on his feet. I am the one in eight Americans who struggle with hunger. People you pass by every day but never knew were hungry. I am hunger in America. Hunger can be hard to recognize. Learn why at IamHungerInAmerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America, 200 Food Bank Strong, and the Ad Council. Hi, I'm Tom Hartman, and since you're listening to NetRootsRadio.com, show your progressive side and go to the Donate button on the bottom of the homepage. It's progressives like you who power NetRoots Radio and keep the progressive message beaming everywhere 24 hours a day. Just go to our Donate button at the bottom of NetRootsRadio.com. Thank you for keeping progressive radio at full power. You're listening to the American Democracy Minute, keeping your government by and for the people. On Memorial Day, an abridged portion of a speech at the U.S. Capitol by legendary campaign finance reformer Doris Granny D. Haddock, the 90-year-old grandmother who walked across the U.S. to bring attention to campaign finance corruption. This morning, we began our walk among the graves of Arlington so that those spirits, some of whom may be old friends, might join us today and that we might ask of them now, Did you, brave spirits, give your lives for a government where we might stand together as free and equal citizens? Or did you give your lives so that laws might be sold to the highest bidder? What might we call the selling of our government from under us? What might we call a change of government from a government of, by, and for the people to a government by and for the wealthy elite? I will not call such a change of government a treason, but those more courageous shadows among us whose blood runs through our flag and our history and whose accomplishments are more solid beneath us than these stone steps, why they might use such a word in angry whispers that trace through the polluted corridors of this once great capital. We speak for these spirits and for ourselves. No, you may not have our democratic republic to sell. What our family members died for, we do not forget. They died for our freedom and equality not for a government of the rich alone. We have a link to the full speech at AmericanDemocracyMinute.org. For the American Democracy Minute, I'm Brian Beal. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1943. That was the day 50,000 striking rubber workers ended their five-day walkout in Akron, Ohio. It was World War II, and the no-strike pledge was in full effect. Bosses were awash in defense contract profits. At the same time, they used the no-strike pledge to violate collective bargaining agreements, crank up assembly line production, and ignore grievances. As one sympathetic headline read, workers forced to strike in defense of their living standards, slashed by soaring prices, taxes, and anti-union profiteers. Workers at Goodyear, Firestone, and Goodrich had petitioned the War Labor Board for an eight-cent raise and shift differentials that they were entitled to per the Little Steel formula. For a year, they waited patiently and were outraged when they learned the board had only granted a three-cent raise. Firestone and Goodrich workers threw down their tools immediately and poured out of the factories. Goodyear workers soon followed. In a protest telegram to the board, United Rubber Workers leaders pointed out that living costs had increased by 23% 
since January 1941. They also noted that essential to maintaining the no-strike agreement was a just settlement of grievances and a $25,000 cap on executive salaries, neither of which had been adhered to. The walkout was one of the first major challenges to the no-strike pledge. Women took the lead as picket captains and dispatchers. Their leadership was accepted without question. Flying pickets cruised the city to enforce picket lines. Black workers at Firestone, impressed by the union's fight for equal rights, figured prominently in the strike. Workers returned to the job with their spirits high, having forced the board to reconsider their demands. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and The Rick Smith Show. Thank you for accompanying us here to the Chef's Table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, River City Hash Mondays on Memorial Day Weekend Monday. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America because there's lots more of us where we come from where it is currently 58 degrees Fahrenheit expecting highs in the mid to upper 80s but I think it'll be over 90 looks like uh, we'll have sunny conditions throughout the day and winds will be out of the northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour mainly clear overnight with lows in the mid 50s maybe a tad warmer winds out of the west northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour then mostly cloudy tomorrow with temperatures plummeting to uh, the mid to upper 70s maybe a little over 80. That's usually what happens. Though the winds will have picked up out of the west-northwest at 10 to 15 miles per hour. Looks like grass pollen is remaining very high here in our town of Rogue River. The air quality index for the region is in the good range at 19 parts per million. And, uh, of course, when we have really nice air quality days they make them burn days so people burn their trash and i'm not just talking about wood and leaves and whatnot but i mean stinky trash how dare they oh look the daytime uv uv index has come down from very high to only high at level seven which means you better take care of your skin because that's still exceedingly high do take care Barometric pressure is rising at 30.1 inches. Visibility is up to 10 miles. And relative humidity is at 76%. Drying out. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. And that is the Weather Underground. London is 59 degrees and cloudy. Paris is 63 and partly cloudy. Rome is 80 degrees and sunny. Kabul is 68 and clear. Hong Kong is 81 and partly cloudy. Tokyo is 73 and mostly cloudy. Melbourne, Victoria, Australia is 51 degrees and clear. San Francisco, California is 54 and partly cloudy. Chicago, Illinois is 61 degrees and merely cloudy. And New York, New York is 71 degrees Fahrenheit and cloudy. And that is weather from around the world brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. Our 
working staff at the World Desk of the Associated Press brings us this first amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, River City Hash Mondays, Memorial Day weekend Monday, by the way. British police say four people were hurt and one was arrested when supporters of Iran's authorities clashed with anti-government protesters at a London event marking the death of President Ibrahim Raisi. The Metropolitan Police Force said officers were called on Friday evening to reports of disorder at a venue in the West London area of Wembley where an event was being held to mark Raisi's death in a helicopter crash. Protesters had gathered outside the venue and clashes broke out. The force said one person was arrested on suspicion of violent disorder. Four people were treated by paramedics for injuries that are not thought to be life-threatening or life-changing. Police ordered those gathered to disperse and said that detectives would examine social media footage and other evidence to see whether more offenses had been committed. Raisi, a pillar of Iran's hardline Islamic regime, died alongside the country's foreign minister and six others in a crash. In the country's mountainous northwest on Sunday, last He was interred last Thursday at Iran's holiest Shiite shrine. Some Iranian expatriates have welcomed Raisi's death. London is home to a large Iranian community, most of whom left in the years since the country's Islamic revolution in 1979. Hardworking staff of the World Desk of the Associated Press brings us this final amuse bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. A Paris court sentenced three high ranking Syrian officials in absentia to life in prison for complicity in war crimes in a landmark case against the regime of Syrian President Bashar Assad and the first such case in Europe. The trial focused on the official's role in the 2013 arrest in Damascus of Mazen Debag, a Franco-Syrian father and his son Patrick, and their subsequent torture and killing. The four-day trial featured harrowing testimonies from survivors and searing accounts from Mazen's brother. Though the verdict was cathartic for plaintiffs, France and Syria do not have an extradition treaty, making the outcome largely symbolic. International arrest warrants for the three former Syrian intelligence officials, Ali Mamluk, Jamil Hassan, and Abdel Salam Mahmoud, have been issued since 2018 to no avail. They are the most senior Syrian officials to go on trial in a European court over crimes committed during the country's civil war. The court proceedings come as Assad has started to shed his longtime status as a pariah that stemmed from the violence unleashed on his opponents. Human rights groups involved in the case hoped it would refocus attention on his atrocities. Clements Bechtart, the Dabag family lawyer from the International Federation for Human Rights, said the verdict was the first recognition in France of the crimes against humanity of the Syrian regime. It is a message of hope for all Syrian victims who are waiting for justice. It is a message that must be addressed to states so that they do not normalize their relations with the regime of Assad, she said. 
The trial began last Tuesday over the torture and killing of the French Syrian father and son who were arrested at the height of Arab Spring-inspired anti-government protests. The two were arrested in Damascus following a crackdown on demonstrations that later turned into a brutal civil war now in its 14th year. Genocide that. All right. That brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. And uh, But you do know Netroots Radio broadcasts on. And we will meet up here tomorrow for Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we will meet up here tomorrow. Right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appétit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des TR, des photos de bord de mer, dans mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, dans mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coère Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver